algebra, we're going to expand the types of functions we're going to graph by talking about exponential functions. Now an exponential function is a function such that we have a base value, which is a, raised to a variable, which is x. We'll notice that it certainly expands rapidly, and then it also will talk about decaying fun functions, which they decay quickly as well. Our first example is to graph the function f of x is 2 to the power of x. So everywhere I see x, I'm going to replace my x value. So I'll first take 2 to the 0 power, and anything to the 0 power is 1. 2 to the first power is 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 to the third power is 8. 2 to the negative first power, when I have a negative power, remember that tells us that we need to move our, our value to the bottom or the denominator. So really this becomes 1 over 2 to the first power, which is still half. 2 to the negative 2 becomes 1 over 2 squared to get rid of that negative power or 1 fourth. And then 2 to the negative third power becomes 1 over 2 cubed, which is 1 over 8. So we have these values for our x and our y values that we can plot. And on the left, I have our graph. Now, what is the difference if our base is a nice whole number versus our base, which may be a fraction? So I have f of x is equal to 1 half to the x power. And actually, the graph is on the next page here. So if I have 1 half to the x power, note that that is the exact same as 2 to the power of negative x, because really we have 1 to the x power over 2 to the x power. And 1 to anything is still just 1, so it doesn't matter. So if I were to bring this back up to the numerator, we would have 2 to the negative x power. So how does 2 to the negative x, how does that compare with 2 to the power of x that we just had? On the left, I have our points from 2 to the x. Knowing that half x is the same as 2 to the power of negative x, I have the values that are listed here. You can check the, the table of values using decimals. But notice this time that we're falling. So the only difference that negative in our exponent has is notice that it reflected over the y-axis. So our original graph had points such as 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 8, and it kind of went this direction. So it's a direct reflection across the y-axis because of that negative value. Let's graph each of the following and describe how the graph is going to be changing. So let's start, we've got our almost parent function of 2 to the power of x. Now let's look at what's going to happen if I have x minus 2 up in the exponent. So I have this x minus 2 up here. How does that negative 2, that subtract 2, change my original graph? I've got a picture of the original graph. Um, the red one is our original graph. This one was f of x is 2 to the power of x. And using decimals, I graphed the f of x is equal to 2 to the x minus 2. Notice that if we have one of our points here, it is just shifted to the right two units. So our graph is shifting to the right two units because of that x minus 2. So if I were to have as an example x plus 3, we could assume that our graph would shift left three units.
what about 2 to the power of x and then I subtract 4 after? 2 to the power of x and then I subtract 4. Well, again, uh, the red one here is f of x is 2x, or 2 to the power of x, excuse me. And then down below here, this blue graph is f of x is 2 to the power of x, and I subtract 4. Notice that my particular point, our y-intercept, notice it's shifted down 4 units. So when we're subtracting outside of the function, we're shifting down. Similarly, if I had 2x, 2 to the power of x plus 3 as my function, we would shift our graph up 3 units. Finally, we also have 5 minus half x. I'm going to rewrite this as 5 minus the fraction half to the power of x. We know that half to the power of x from the first part of our lesson is 2 to the power of negative x. We already determined that 2 to the power of negative x would reflect across the y-axis. Also, we could rewrite this actually as f of x is equal to 2 to the power of negative x, excuse me, negative 2 to the power of negative x, and then add 5. Recall that this add 5 based on that last example means that we're going to shift up 5 units. But what about this negative out front? This negative out front and this negative are our reflection pieces. Well, if the part that's in our exponent reflects across the y-axis, then I know that the negative out front of my, my function reflects across the x-axis. So putting it all together, we're first going to reflect across the y-axis when we start at 2 to the power of x, when I put that negative x to, in our exponent. Then we're going to reflect across the x-axis. And finally, we'll shift our graph up 5 units. I have what they might look like here. Here I have our function y is equal to 2 to the power of x, and this blue one is the function y is equal to negative 2 to the power of negative x plus 5. And you can fill in the table of values on your own. This leads us to the compound interest formula. The compound interest of a certain amount of money to which a principal P will grow after T amount of years at a particular interest rate in decimal form compounded a certain time per year is given by this formula. So let's suppose that $100,000 is what we're going to invest at 6.5% interest compounded semi-annually. So here we have our value of P, what we're, the amount that we're going to invest. We have our interest rate, and our rate, remember, is going to be in decimal form, so 65 hundredths. Compounded semi-annually means that we're going to compound two times per year, and that will be our N value. However, it doesn't give us how many years we're going to grow this. We're just going to determine what it's going to look like and then we'll graph it, which I have down below. So we have 100,000 as our, the value we're putting into our account. We have our interest rate written as a decimal and the amount of times it's compounded as two. Substituting them each into the particular formula here, and n goes in two locations, we have the function then 100,000 times one plus, uh, Clearly, I didn't move my decimal.
all the way. Excuse me for that. Divided by 2 to the power of 2 to the amount of time that we're doing this for. When I divide and add, we'll have 1.0325 to the power of 2t. Now when I graph this, we can pull some information from this by using, you could use decimals. This is the one that was given within the lesson, but you can use decimals and get this exact same graph. We can pull some information. We can also utilize the table from Desmos to help us gain some knowledge here about how much money we're going to obtain after zero, four, eight, and 10 years when we substitute those values into our function that we created. Well, if we have no amount of years that have passed, it would be assumed that we would still have our initial investment of 100,000 because no time has passed. After four years, we should obtain approximately $129,157, which when I look here, it about matches on my graph. If I invest for eight years, we should have obtained approximately $166,817.25. So when I look at my graph, that matches for 10 years. And further, we can find out for how, how many years. I mean, if I wanted to look at 20 years about how much money would I have invested, we could certainly do that. Further, we could go the opposite direction and we could find out if I wanted to determine how much, how long it would take me to obtain, let's say 250,000, I could determine about how long that would take me to do that. And it appears it might be about 12 and a half, 12 to 13 years in order for my investment to be a return of 250,000. So we can do a lot of things with this graph and we're gonna find out in part D on the next page here. It's asking us for when the money will reach $400,000. So here in particular, we're, we're interested where our graph, how long it will take our graph to reach $400,000. $400,000. So it's going to be over here somewhere. We're not quite sure. We want to be pretty exact on, on how that will happen. So we're interested in particularly when y is going to be $400,000 because we know when y is equal to a number, this creates a horizontal line. And where it's going to intersect with the graph that we have. So this is what we call the intersect method. We also can solve here because we want to know where these two are equal. In Desmos, I'm going to let y equal $400,000, which will create a horizontal line. And on my second line, I'm going to let it be the equation or our function. I'm also going to set my window in Desmos so that I don't have to keep hitting the zoom out button. Um, and you can do however however it works for you. If it helps you just to hit the zoom out button, that's okay too. Then we're going to find the point at which they intersect. So I'm going to go to decimals real quick and I'm going to set this up so we can see what it looks like. So first I'm going to say y is equal to 400,000. Is one too many? And then in my second line, I'm going to have y is equal to 100,000 times 1.0325 to the power of 2x. Notice we can't see the graph, so I'm going to hit the... Um, the wrench in the top right corner so that I can set my window. Uh, we don't care about what's happening. Our X values is time. We can't go backwards in time, so it starts from zero. And maybe we'll put till 30 years. And we can take steps by five years at a time. That might be nice. Um, and our Y values, we can't, we can't invest negative dollar values. So I'm gonna start my Y values at zero and then just go to 500,000. Um, as you see by doing this, we're able to see the y equals 400,000, the red line there, and then our particular graph is the blue line. 
When I tap here, I can determine where they intersect. Our x value here is 21.6. So we could say that about 21.7 when rounded, amount of years since the original investment. So it'll take about 21 years to reach $400,000, nearly 22 years, I should say, to reach $400,000 in our account. Another way with which we could do this is to solve our equation. So remember our original equation was 400,000 equals 100,000 times 1.0325 to the power of 2x. So we could solve this and determine where we cross the y, or excuse me, the x-axis. This is known as the zero method. What are the zeros of this equation? So to get y by itself, we would have to subtract the 400,000 from, from our equation. Notice in the far right, bottom right hand corner, we can kind of see, so I'm going our graph, but we need to know our x-axis location. So I'm gonna change a little bit of my x-axis here. I'm gonna change, I'm gonna leave it, I guess, at our little bit from about zero to about 30 here. But I'm also going to change my y-axis so I can see um, a little bit more detail the x-axis itself. So now I can see the x-axis just at the very bottom here, but particularly I'm interested where it's crossing. We're finding the zero. So what is the solution? When I tap on the x-axis, I also get the same result of about 22 years. So between 21 and 22 years, we will reach 400,000. Both of these methods, the intersect method or the zero method, are great ways in order to make this work. We also want to talk about Euler's number. He's a very special number for us and can be used in many different occasions. But Euler's number is similar to a pi, where it's just a random irrational number. So here it's asking us to find each value of e to the x to four decimal places using the e to the x key on a particular calculator. You can do this using decimals. So to do that on decimals, we're gonna pop back over there and I'm gonna set my screen back to home here. Um, on the ABC button, we can type ABC and actually just hit E. And we'll notice when we tap the letter E, here is Euler's number. We can also raise Euler's number at our first example was to the third power and it will pop up on the bottom right there that 20.0855. We can also take Euler's number and we can raise it to negative exponents as well. So let's try negative 0 0.23 and we end up with a decimal. But what's also unique, just like any other value that when we take to the power of 0, it doesn't matter what value we take to the power of 0, our answer will always be 1. It also has similar properties that the example that we had earlier, that two to the power of x. If we have e to the power of x itself, when we go to example six here, we take e to the power of x. We know that e to the power of zero is one. We get a bunch of random decimals, and this is what it looks like here, e to the power of x. Just like when we had 2 to the power of negative x, it reflects across the y-axis. So on the right-hand side, I have e to the power of negative x. So just like 2 to the power of um, x, it has the same properties, where e to the power of a negative value of x will reflect across the y-axis. So let's talk about a couple of different ways that our base, since our base is changing from two to a different value. If we have e to the power of x plus three, just like um, two to the power of x plus three, we move to the right, excuse me, move to the left, we're also going to move to the left here, three units. So here's our original in blue. And e to the power of x plus three, is in red here. Notice that a particular point of interest might be the y-intercept 
and our y-intercept here shifted three units to the left. What about e to the power of negative half x? Negative half x. Well, we know that that negative value is going to create a reflection across the y-axis. So the negative value is going to be a reflection across the y-axis. We know that. But how does that half value change thing? That half value is a horizontal stretch. Since again, that value is less than one. Going back to, to unit two on um, how things are moving and shaking when we um, move polynomial pieces around, um, that, that top value in the exponent will tell us if we're having a horizontal or vertical stretch. And because that half is out front of the x value, that is going to be a horizontal a horizontal stretch. I have the original equation here in red. So our original one here is e to the power of x. This blue one here is certainly the reflection over uh, y, y, the y-axis and then it is stretched horizontally. So we can see it's moving further away from that y-axis. So it's stretching about that x-axis. So then this one is e to the power of negative half x. In our final example, we have 1 minus e to the power of negative 2x. I'm going to rearrange this uh, for the sake of putting things kind of in order. We have negative e to the power of negative 2x plus 1. We already know that this negative in the exponent, this is going to be a reflection across the y-axis because it is a value that is greater than 1 in the exponent there. Instead of a horizontal stretch, we're going to have a horizontal shrink. A horizontal shrink so we're gonna get closer and then the negative value in front of e is going to be the reflection since though negative in the exponent is a reflection across the y-axis this one is a reflect across the x-axis And finally, this plus one tells us that we're going to shift everything up one unit. So putting it all together here, we are going to shrink horizontally. We'll reflect across the y-axis and also reflect across the x-axis and then finally shift our graph up one unit. Here is the original equation or function, I should, excuse me. We have y is equal to e to the x, and then the blue one is our modified version of a negative e to the negative 2x plus 1. And that concludes our lesson talking about exponential functions, their graphs, a little bit about Euler's number and how we can move and shake those graphs around as well as compound interest.